Welcome to IQT Explains, a series on the IQT podcast where we explore technology trends and their impact on national security. I'm your host, Sarah Sewell, and today we're going to talk about critical minerals. Critical minerals are a collection of minerals, including so-called rare earth elements that the government has deemed vital to national security. They're used in a range of modern technologies from cell phones to airplanes, and they will be increasingly central to the nation's transition to greener energy. Demand for critical minerals is projected to grow dramatically, yet the United States and many other nations face major vulnerabilities because China controls so much of the global supply chain. China has literally cornered the market on not just on the mining of critical minerals, but also on the refining process. And China has shown a willingness to weaponize its monopoly. Just ask Japan about China's two month cutoff of rare earth elements. China has more recently moved to require both the monitoring and in some cases, the licensing of its critical mineral exports. So diversifying critical mineral supply chains has become a Washington preoccupation. We face several challenges, however, not just access to minerals, but also the willingness to mine and refine them. Both are messy and dangerous, highly polluting. Getting approval for new mines is therefore often difficult. Finding more environmentally sound approaches to collecting and refining critical minerals will be crucial as the West seeks to meet demand and secure its national supply chain. We have three guests that run companies that are working to help us do just that. So let me introduce these CEOs. Nicole Richards has been the CEO of Alonia since the company's founding in 2019. Prior to that, she was Director of Growth Strategy and M&A for DuPont's Water Solutions Division and was previously a Global Director at Solvay that focused on sustainability solutions in materials and chemicals. Nick Myers is the CEO of Phoenix Tailings. His background is in physics and in the manufacturing sector. He moved into finance and became involved in the Boston startup ecosystem where he worked at the VC fund Techstars prior to co-founding Phoenix Tailings. And then we have Oliver Gunasekra, who's the CEO and co-founder of Impossible Metals. He's a serial deep tech entrepreneur with over 30 years of experience across a variety of fields, having led mobile business development at Arm, as well as founding NG Kodak. So let's start by learning how each of these companies will help the United States address critical mineral supply chain security. Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about what Alonia will do? Hi, Sarah, absolutely. So Alonia exists to develop and deploy transformational biological solutions for the world's toughest waste challenges. And when we started with this vision, one of the most challenging aspects was deciding where to focus on our attention. So we developed this rubric to look at areas that had high unmet needs, where biology had an existing proof point and was a logical solution set based on its properties, and where there was a customer with a willingness to pay for the solutions. And I'll come back to this last one later. Um, but for us, rare earth was an early and obvious fit for the reason, Sarah, that you just stated in terms of the demand, the national security interest, and rare earth being an energy critical element. And biology has specificity, and that's one of the qualities about it that make it a great um, fit in some of these applications. And it can be tailored for solutions like selectivity and lanthanides. And, and that's really the heart of some of the challenges and why so much processing is done overseas and in China in particular, is that these lanthanides, 15 of them, um, are very chemically similar and has to do with lots of reasons uh, um, chemically on why that is. But um, we know from previous work that uh, that there are proteins that exist that can separate lanthanides from things like iron or transition metals. And that's a really critical property when you think of the waste streams that these lanthanides come in, which 
largely are things like e-waste or mine tailings waste. Um, and so we've picked up from this work that had been done previously to make the transition from it can separate it from iron, but can it separate itself from each other, like dysprosium and terbium and neodymium. And at Alonia, we believe that waste is a failure of imagination and that we don't need to rely on China. We don't need to open new mines that will take 15 plus years to get to the processing stage and further destroy our environment. 1% of rare earth is upcycled today, which is the lowest of all metals. And so if we just do more recycling of things like hard drive waste or mine tailings, is that we can come a long way to supply the needs that we have in the U.S. Um, and so that's a big part of what our mission is. And there's you know lots of challenges within there, but um, it's a project we're very excited about the um, progress that we've made. And so just to simplify it for our listeners, when you talk about lanthanides, you're really talking about rare earth elements that you're able to separate out from mine tailings? Correct. And so in mine tailings, it's, it's particularly interesting and unique. And so when you and think what of- what are tailings? Explain tailings. Sure. So um, when, when we mine uh, ore from the ground, there is up to, call it 17%-ish, of what we mine is actually the desired metal and everything else in there is waste and that's tailing. And so in that tailing, there's lots of other things in there um, that uh, have no value or some value. And so rare earth in many of these tailings exist in very small quantities. Um, as an example, it could be anywhere from like one to 0.1% of the tailings is rare earth. And so you've got this highly desired metal in very low concentrations. And so challenge one is how do you separate that economically? And then challenge two is how do you separate those very chemically similar lanthanides from each other? And, and you've got a new approach to doing that. Correct. Great. Thank you so much. So, so let's go to Nick now. Nick, Phoenix Tailings as the, the name of your company suggests that you're also dealing with tailings, the mine waste, but you have a different approach to it. And you're also dealing with the processing side. Can you tell us a little bit about the company's role? First off, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Phoenix Tailings was founded about six years ago or so. I met my co-founder, Dr. Tomas alone at a Bible study of all things. And so we're talking about the biggest problems in the world, right? One you just hit on, is actually how we get the raw materials that we need to be successful. And we believe key uh, core technology and radically innovative technology is essential to achieving this, but it's not the only thing. So our whole mission is just rethink how we actually approach harvesting raw materials and creating the final products needed to empower this massive transition that the whole world is looking to do. Instead of discarding massive amounts of waste in the processing and digging up of raw materials, why don't we take the waste we've already produced and turn to the final metal and metal alloys, right? At the end of the day, the world needs metal to make the final products. They don't usually use oxide for say magnet production, which is primarily the application for rare earths. So, uh, and the majority of the waste actually comes from the processing of the oxides to the final metal and metal alloy. The real gap in the world supply chain is not on the digging up of the original ores. The famous quote by Robert Friedrich, one of the founders of modern day mining is in fact, rare earths are neither rare nor are the earths. Um, so at Phoenix, we focus on the processing of it key as the key part we built our radically innovative technology around, taking individual oxides and reducing them to the final metal and metal alloys, avoiding Chinese supply chain constraints, which is at 97% of the final metal and metal alloy itself, and able to harvest the material directly from concentrates. And we harvest those concentrates themselves from tailings, bringing together radically innovative technologies some we build ourselves, others we work with incredible people all, all in many different companies around to be able to implement on site. But at the end of the day, we're all about production and making sure we can produce the final metals and metal alloys that the world needs us to, to actually sustain its growth. And so today, Phoenix Tailings is one of the only final metal producers of rare earth metals in the Western Hemisphere. And we produce commercially today in Burlington, Massachusetts. Fantastic. And can you talk a little bit about 
what it is that you're ex well let's let's do that when we come to technology so oliver transitioning to you we've heard from two companies that are busy making sure that they can tap existing resources to to uh, attract new critical materials from them um, you've got a different value proposition for your company impossible metals can you describe it to us Yes, um, I'm super happy to be here. And, you know, what we're doing is deep sea mining, but without destroying the marine habitat. So we've built these autonomous underwater vehicles, these robots that go to the deep seabed and they use computer vision and AI and selectively pick up these rocks. I'm, I'm actually holding one of them here. And these, these rocks, uh, they're called nodules. They're actually the planet's biggest source of critical minerals for batteries, for nickel and cobalt. There's something like 10x more of this metal on the deep seabed than there is on land. And you know why, why this matters is because the size of the resource is, is a very big factor, but also is the grade because the economics of mining is driven a lot by the grade of the resource. If you have a high grade resource, for instance, 3.2% for nickel equivalent, that means that you have a lot of margin. And one of the things that China's good at is winning the low cost, getting the supply, and then they're locked in. But we can access the resource on the seabed with the least environmental impact, but also the least cost. And today, China kind of dominates domestic mining. Something like nickel, they have about 70% of the mines. Typically, they're in places like Indonesia. And for cobalt, they're in Africa. But they're operated and owned by Chinese companies. And so that's a strategic risk. In the deep seabed, they do have five permits. But the majority are still uh, available for, for other countries. So that's basically what we do. So Oliver, can you, can you building on that, what is it about the technology that is different um, and, and challenging that allows you to take this approach with uh, seabed nodules? Yeah, um, invented in the 1960s and tested in the 1970s was this uh, dredging technology with riser pumps. And that's what everyone else, including the Chinese, are proposing to use. So it's this massive machine that's lowered on the seabed floor and it literally vacuums up and sends it up a tube we felt that new technology could really change the balance, both environmentally and economically. And so what we have invented is these autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs, underwater robots, that can go up to four miles underwater and they hover above the seabed and they have an array of cameras and they look for the nodules and they look for life that is on a few of them, like corals and sponges. And if we see that, we avoid harvesting if we uh, don't detect the life, we just use the camera to direct the robotic arm to pick up. So it's really designed to minimize the environmental impact. The vehicle itself carries the payload up and down the water column. There is no tether, they're battery powered, they're reusable, we swap the battery. And by having a fleet of these, we can actually do very many uh, millions of tons of, of material every single year. And how automated is this and what's the role of AI? It's 100% automated. Uh, these, these robots are, you know, think of them like a car, but they go underwater. So they electric vehicle, they have a battery pack and the AI is used to, uh, to detect the nodules on the seabed floor so we can move the arm. Uh, to go and pick them up, but it's also used to detect uh, the megafauna, the corals, the sponges, and other forms of life that do exist, and so we avoid it. And all of that runs on an NVIDIA GPU that's embedded in the system. Uh, one of the challenges of subsea is that you have very poor communication. We cannot use radio waves, so we have to create our own 3D positioning system, a bit like GPS. Uh, we also have to use acoustic modems to communicate, but because it's low latency, it's high high latency, unreliable, we basically allow them to work fully autonomously. And when they can sync up, they do. 
Fantastic. And so the, the key takeaway is that unlike this dredging that creates sort of, you know, massive disruption and plumes of sediment, et cetera, you've got a really surgical tailored approach to identifying precisely what's, what's necessary and what's going to be least environmentally disruptive as you search for these critical minerals. Yeah, that's exactly right. We, we took all of the criticism that people had of this 1960s technology and really invented a system. It minimizes the noise pollution, the light pollution, the sediment, uh, the big sediment um, swarms that, 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 and plumes that are generated. It, uh, it preserves biodiversity. Um, you know, we've really gone to great lengths to minimize the environmental impact, but it's also less expensive because we don't need a dedicated ship and it doesn't have any single point of failures. So it's really using a 21st century approach versus a 1960s approach that everyone else is doing. Fantastic. And so, so Nick, as we think about the, the technologies that are critical to Phoenix tailings, you know, what was the process by which you discovered those or you decided that, that these were great technologies to bring to you know, mining and, and refining? You know, I wouldn't really phrase it that way. If I wouldn't, if I don't mind. I'd uh, phrase it a little bit differently. We saw a problem in the world and we said, let's bring together the best people on the planet to solve this problem. Right, we have 33 patents and trade secrets around our process through various different ways. We're innovating daily. We come up with new technologies daily to solve this problem. But at the end of the day, really, it, it doesn't matter. Like our, our, our key technology we started off with is radically different than what we have now. And I'm sure mm -hmm. the technology in the future will develop from there, right? It's really about solving the supply chain, not developing cool technology that makes a, is exciting for people. It's about really solving this issue of supply chain all the way through, right? Dr. Tomas Villalon is our CTO, and he's really leads this initiative with the entirety of the Phoenix Tailings team from our mixed halide molten salt electrolysis cell that allows us to, uh, to selectively reduce individual rare earth oxides at 40% less energy consumption uh, with zero emissions and zero waste from the process. Oh, by the way, and it's the uh, hits on Chinese economics all the way through. So you're not paying a high end premium for that end product to things like our separation system, leveraging uh, SX circuits with the new novel chemistries that doesn't generate emissions. But it also means things like, you know, traditional flocculation tanks, right? That are used in normal mining operations day in and day out, just modifying it slightly so it doesn't produce waste. All mm -hmm. of those things coming together actually are what make an end production possible. Uh, and it's amazing. Fair what people do. But you've but, got some you've got some novel new approaches that have really distinguished your company's value proposition. Of course, of course, you have to. But it's really about yeah. the production. You have to hit economics, not just make cool technology. That's the key thing. So for right. us, we have novel metallization cell and novel processing, which is really what's differentiated us and allow us to go to market that much faster. But at the end of the day, Fantastic. keep an eye on economics. And that's, that's such a different um, approach to a similar problem for Nicole's company. So, so Alonia, how did you guys come to the technology that really allows you to be an economically viable, biologically driven technology solution? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So, I mean, we looked at, um, we, we look at it from a, is it, can we convince ourselves that it's theoretically possible? And so we do a lot of work before we delve too far into the details on what would it take to make a cost-effective solution? And, and so then we, we look at that in the context of our development plan and disaggregate those risks and work on them. And so part of, there's, there's two, two key components to it. One is, can you get the biology right? Can you get the biology right in that you're identifying the, the proteins that are needed to bind what is needed to be bound to separate those um, elements that you wish to separate? So is that theoretically possible? And, and that's what we've made um, great strides in, in looking at. And then, and then once you have that, what do you do with it? And what kind of system do you put that in from the deployment perspective? And so um, that's another one where um, great strides have been made and we've been able to identify at the lab scale right now um, that there is a process that we can incorporate our proteins into that allow for the, uh, 
um, separation of the rare earth from these waste materials and the reusability of it, because that's really key in making this economically viable. Um, one pass for biology would, you know, would, would put an end to this project because it would cost more than the metals are even worth. But the ability to be able to reuse that process a number of times is, is what really unlocks the potential of this being a viable solution. And that's a discovery that, you know, we recently just made. Nicole, for, for Alonia, what, what, is the, what is the hurdle that you face now as you seek to prove out your technology and scale it? Yeah, I think there's I, I think there's two hurdles. There's a, a technical hurdle, and then I think there's a longer term commercial hurdle. And I'd like to touch on both if I can just briefly. Please. And so the the technical hurdle is, is really twofold. It's one, it's that um, low concentration, and um, and the second part to that is the varying waste stream. And and when we look to upcycle waste in a number of cases, the variability of that waste stream is uh, challenging. And so, you're, you know, you're dealing with varying levels of metal and pH and different um, geo and biological components that make that up. So finding biology that is robust enough to work in that environment at those low concentrations is um, what we have to engineer into those proteins next. Um, so that's the, the, the biggest next hurdle um, from the technology development. From the commercial development, you know, when when we look at the viability of um, a startup producing technology for this particular application, one of the questions we have is really the commitment of the mining partners and the U.S. government um, to commit to wanting a domestic environmentally friendly source. And this one is tricky because unlike a lot of things that we're working on, um, there's already a solution that exists. It's a terrible environmentally disastrous and unsafe solution to separate rare earths, but it exists, it exists in China. And so while we know that the solutions we're working on or we believe are scalable, it will take time. Um, and, and that can be a barrier to entry is, do we have the patience to, um, to get these startup technologies to the point where they're viable? And, and we know China announced this week, they're at a 5% growth rate. They're, putting a sign out on their storefront window saying we're open for business. They have a potential to cut costs, flood demand, and put competitors out of business. That's disastrous for a startup. Um, and so we are carefully looking at um, the investments made by the government, made by our mining partners um, to this endeavor um, and how sustainable and committed they are, because that's really what we believe it will take to put the supply chain in place that's needed to enable solutions. And access to tailings, is that a, a challenge for you? Um, we do not believe that that is a big hurdle because we have been um, in conversations with several mining companies and they have all expressed interest in this area. And so, you know, of course, there's when you're working with major mining companies, you know, there's lots of conversations around IP and all of that. but um, access to the tailings is something that, and, and separation of rare earth from their tailings, not only has a monetary benefit for them, but it's also environmentally favorable because the more metal you remove from these minings, the less environmental liability they have on the other side. So, you know, it, it's advantageous on the, on, on both sides of the balance sheet for them. And so we don't think that that's going to be a barrier. Oliver, can you talk a little bit about the hurdles that you see ahead for impossible metals from either a technological or perhaps more uh, opposite uh, a, a, a commercial or a geopolitical lens? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have a lot of technical work ahead, although we're getting, you know, we hope to be picking up more children in the deep ocean in, in the next few months. But I would, you know, I would say that's more internal, a lot of hard engineering. But the biggest uh, issue I think is really the perception of deep sea mining. It, it, it has a really negative perception. I mean, all mining has a negative perception. Deep sea mining has a really bad perception. Um, you know, a lot of people I think are beginning to realize that 
if we're going to get to net zero, we actually have to have massive amounts of mining. And all of the companies on, on this, uh, on, on this podcast are really going to be critical because that's, that's what this transition needs. We're moving away from fossil fuels to primarily electrification. Electrification needs metals and rare earths, uh, et cetera. But the perception of deep sea mining is driven by the 1960s technology, the dredging technology, which now some public companies are proposing to go mining in the next couple of years. And so there's a big environmental outreach to try and stop that. And, you know, what we feel is that it doesn't make sense to ban a location, especially a location that's 71% of the surface area of our planet. What we should do is ban the technologies that are inappropriate and enable the new technologies to innovate that can significantly reduce the environmental impact. But getting that message out isn't easy because we're not a public company, we're still a startup. Uh, and, you know, and so that perception is probably the hardest thing that we have to try to get people across that deep sea mining doesn't mean just dredging. It can be done, in our view, a very responsible way. And in fact, a way that's maybe far more responsible than on land. And it can be done potentially in our own waters. So the US itself has these resources within its territorial waters. And, you know, the uh, Department of the Interior has authority to kind of grant permits. And, and so I think given that so much of this metal is needed and so much of it is overseas, we should at least start the process to investigate accessing it in our own waters and getting that message out, I think is our biggest challenge, uh, given our technology is different than the dredging, but people don't know. Thanks. So Nick, over to you to talk about what you see as the biggest challenges for, for Phoenix, whether they're the continued innovation on the technological side or whether there are commercial or other kinds of hurdles that you face? Yeah, absolutely. So the the major challenges that we see really is speed. At the end of the day, people can make a lot of money producing rare earth metals or any other critical metals. Right? Terbium alone sells for over a million dollars a ton. It's a very, very, very good metal to make, right? The challenge is with private capital markets on their own, the time may not really align with exactly what the US's initiatives mean, right? At the end of the day, as soon as it does everything right, we will be successful. We will be very radically uh, powerful and make a lot of money for ourselves, our shareholders, and everyone around, right? But it may take longer than what the US is willing to stomach. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the, the government can step in in a lot of ways to help alleviate that cost of capital that you see because of the Chinese influence, like the Chinese price fluctuations that occur because the Chinese control the whole market, which causes a huge risk and adverse um, reactions from private investors, right? The US government come in, guarantee loans, support initiatives, push things forward in a sustainable and effective way to help counteract that challenges that you see. And that's where we see the best possible uh, support given in, in the long-term future, but also one of the biggest challenges, right? I think uh, with Alonia and Possible Metals and, our, and ourselves at Phoenix, right, we will see that challenge of growing as fast as we possibly can. And we really need to do so at a much faster rate than I think the, the world can really even handle at this point. So that's primarily it. So as we think about sort of the last question that I'm hoping each of you can help share with your answer with the viewers is, is what would you have the government do more of and you've given us a preview i'm wondering nick can you can you, are there any examples of where you think government has already done something important and useful in terms of helping accelerate innovation to solve supply chain security issues with critical minerals and what would you like them to do specifically more of yeah absolutely uh, I think SBIRs are really great and more initiatives like that really help push things forward. Can you explain to our viewers what an SBIR is? Of course. An SBIR is a, is a program that which, you know, they're a government grant that gives to small businesses doing research on new projects. Some of them larger scale, some of them are smaller scale. It just depends. And it's really helpful for early stage businesses to approach new technologies that they wouldn't otherwise pursue because it's more of an idea and asking a private investor to finance a highly risky new technology, say on 
bacterial leaching of new material, uh, new metals, or a rare metal production process that we had originally started, or one of the new recent SBIRs that we received was on a carbon negative process to recover nickel, copper, cobalt from nickel tailings. Right? We would not pursue that without the government's support because it helps de-risk this. So I can tell my investors, hey, look, the government's reducing the cost of capital here. You can invest in this at a much steeper discount and it proves out to have the potential return in the future, which a much lower risk. It's very helpful. Beyond that, there's new things like the NDIA bill, uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, there's a new bills that are being put forward to allow for the military to purchase metal directly. So it's not just beholden to the strategic stockpile groups. And there's a number of tax incentives there. Really, the main thing we have to do is control the price fluctuations that Chinese have. If the Chinese set the prices and produce all the materials, it's going to be very hard for any other player, whether it's ourselves or any other innovative technology, to produce any product because we really are beholden to our competitors, which is very, very challenging to operate in. Yeah. And we've seen the willingness of China to undercut pricing in order to maintain its monopoly. That is, that is a pretty standard piece of the playbook. So those are great, great comments. Um, Nicole, what would you like to see government do more of? So from the, from the government perspective, I think, you know, what the government has been doing really well is supporting innovation through government grants and through a commitment to um, further investments. I think we really need to look at this and take a long-term strategic view. This is not something that we can invest in for two years and then walk away from. Mm -hmm. These technologies take time to develop and they take time to deploy. And I also think that having incentives for the um, for the consumers that are buying these strategic metals that are outside of the government is important to encourage them to look for alternative sources versus importing. And that's where the do you tax the imports and regulate that or do you incentivize the behaviors of the people that are using the metals and, and maybe it's some combination of both. So continue with the investments that the government is making today, take a long term view with those commitments and then encouraging the users to look for domestic supply sources versus imports. Which is part of what the IRA has done with battery technology and EVs, right? So, mm -hmm. so right direction, but do more and have a longer term view. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. And, and to close us out, Oliver, would you share your perspective on, on where government should be, should be, what they should be thinking, what policymakers should be thinking about and what government should do? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say I'm a big fan of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I think what it's done to onshore and try and break our dependency on, on China for batteries and, and critical minerals is great. I'd love to see more of that, but I think it's a, a really encouraging. Uh, I would reinforce any non-dilutive funding, whether it's from the loan program office or others, are very, very helpful for early stage companies, especially when we have to build first of its kind infrastructure. It's difficult to get funding from traditional sources. Government can really help. Uh, two specific things that I personally would like to see for our business. I'd like to see mapping of U.S. waters for critical minerals. Um, I know there is some work, but I think it's 2030. I think we would like to see that sooner. Uh, let's at least understand what exists in our own waters, uh, especially as that can remove the need to, to go to China or China-controlled Africa or Indonesia. Uh, and then a nice would be, it would be nice to ratify the, UN, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, that's a 1982 law that has been ratified by 167 countries. Uh, if you add up the population, it's 93% of governments on the planet have ratified that. We are really the only major country that has not. Um, and that means that we don't have any formal say in how the rules are made around mining in international waters. We can't uh, actually help create those rules. Uh, American companies cannot receive permits uh, and it's a big disadvantage. And, and so I would love to see Congress formally ratify that uh, that, that rule. Um, so those, those are the things I would like to see. Thanks. And just to remind viewers, you know, you've been um, talking about the possibility of deep sea mining in U.S. territorial waters when you'd call for ratification of the Law of the Sea Convention. You know, the 
the that affects a, a very different part of the world's deep seabed, but it is an, a place of great power competition. And as you noted, China has the majority of the permits uh, awaiting uh, action once the the go ahead is given. And we might note that you know Norway has recently announced its interest in um, commencing seabed mining. So. We, the, the exigencies of national security and the desire on the part of many governments to find uh, more secure access to critical minerals will likely keep driving uh, policies at both the national and the international level. But what's so exciting is to hear from you three as being really pioneers in this, this new approach of of meeting a, a longstanding need with more environmentally responsible solutions, because it was in many ways the environmental hazards associated with critical minerals mining and, and processing that led to the offshoring and ultimately to the Chinese current monopoly. You're doing your part at the national level to, to essentially make critical minerals uh, mining and then uh, processing, uh, in some cases, safe for America, if you will. And, uh, and thank you for your leadership in that vein. And thank you for, for joining us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in to, to listen to us today, this episode of IQT Explains. And feel free to subscribe to the overall podcast or learn more on IQT's website at www.iqt.org. Thanks again for everyone for, for being with us and particularly to our, our innovators. Mm -hmm.